good morning ladies and gentlemen these are indeed very difficult times especially in our country and the next symposium is aptly titled surgery during difficult times and uh, we have three speakers and uh, the first speaker requires uh, no introduction he is dr nisanka jayawardena the uh, for, uh, former past president of the college of surgeons of sri lanka and he is now a consultant surgeon at the national hospital of sri lanka and uh, the title of his talk is saving starts at home so he will tell us how to save at home over to you nisanka thank you ishan for that kind introduction and uh, good morning uh, everybody uh, i think this is a very suitable uh, topic these days and i am trying to uh, try and find out uh, what ways we can train uh, we can save in the mainly the public sector because uh, the private sector here is quite uh, they are quite efficient and uh, public sector we have as all of you know public sector is free for all and as anything free there is little appreciation so we have certain things certain certain practices which we inherited from our friends before 1948 they were doing those practices at that time 1948 and they have gone progressed a long distance while we had been stagnated somewhere there in certain aspects so uh, what i meant was we got it from we, our system is mainly is from uk and and we were a crown colony so we our systems are still the systems you had in uk in 1948 and very little progress so we have to think and change it however thanks to many our uh, the the health indices will show with what we have we have performed remarkably well now this is uh, taken from who data Uh, if you compare the sri lankan's life expectancy at birth uh with the lower income countries and of course our neighbors in south asia we are on a much better wicket so we our health system is fairly good but we have things to improve same uh even if you take the child mortality below, below five years still we are having very low mortality thanks to uh, hard work of our health professionals now uh, if you take how our how the health expenses are met now some time back it was mainly the public sector out of the total budget i think the public sector was bearing uh, more than 50% and out of pocket expenditure expenditure in the private sector was less but now there is a transition now out of pocket expenditure um, in the private sector is uh, is about 57% and public sector expenditure is reducing so but i will here deal mainly with the central government and state regional local government hospitals they are basically the public sector hospitals so uh, when you take the the percentage of expenses of the total health budget which is about 3.8% of gdp we spend mostly for curative care 73% for curative care and preventive care is only 3% so i wonder uh, in the in the age of increasing uh, non communicable diseases if we spend more on preventive care whether we should be able to reduce 
our curative care expenses because curative care expenses are massive while preventive care expenses are not that much. And similarly, we are spending just 1% on governance, health system, and financing administration. So, so I, it's, a, it's a just a minute amount, 1%. And we are, I wonder whether if we spend more to strengthen these aspects, whether we could, uh, we could economize uh, the, the hospital system. So if you take a breakdown, again, uh, the, the most, the, it's, uh, the, the yellow line is materials and services used. We are using 45% plus one, uh, point one uh, for the materials and services used. And then compensation of employees, that means salaries, we are using uh, about 18%. This is a breakdown how we use our, uh, this is a ministry uh, data, uh, how we use our public sector uh, money. So saving, of course, saving is the most familiar word in present day Sri Lanka. So everybody is trying to save. So how can you save uh, by, uh, I thought we can save by, optimize, by optimizing the utilization of resources and material, encouraging burden sharing and income generation, and stringent maintenance of accounts and good quality audit. So our admissions are very, very loose. The patients come and get admitted, just admitted. And they stay on in the ward. We don't discharge in time. So we spend a lot of money on that. And our system, if a patient comes and demands, we have to admit him. And also the laboratory investigations and medicines in the hospitals are not very well audited. And uh, sometimes we repeat, sad to say, we repeat the same investigations. Sometimes we don't, we uh, order some unnecessary investigations. Especially the junior staff, just to, you know, escape from the blame, uh, say if, if the patient is for anesthesia, the junior doctor will uh, order the whole gamut of investigations, which is necessary and not necessary, just to get the, you know, escape from the blame of the anesthetist the next day. So uh, I think this is lack of protocols. So we should have protocols and we should adhere to protocols. Then we use, we have to use cheaper but effective alternatives in place of more expensive material. For instance, if you are doing a TEP, uh, the, the laparoscopic total extraperitoneal repair, there are so many measures which are very expensive. But at the same time, you can just use a normal mesh uh, and cut and use, which is about maybe about one fourth of the expense. So these things have to be sought. And also the government should take you know, uh, steps to implement these things uh, above the, the personal whims and fancies of uh, physicians and uh, so many other staff members. Uh, I think governments should take over. There should be expert panels to, to decide on the material we are using. And of course, protocols for use of medicines uh, uh, like antibiotics, discussed and ad adhered to by a committee comprising all the stakeholders and give priority to produced what, what are produced in this country with the material in this country. So then the next one is optimize utilization of resources and material, training of personnel to maintain expensive equipment because generally the most junior, most uneducated person is dealing with our multi-million uh, rupee worth of equipment like laparoscopes and endoscopes. And their main technique is, you know, just pure brutal strength. So if something is not coming off, they'll pull. 
and uh, the thing comes off with the pocket, uh, the, with the socket, right? So, so what I mean is there should be a separate class uh, uh, who is handling these very important equipment and also to have them repaired and serviced in due, due time to, may, to increase the lifespan. Then sharing of expensive, expensive instruments with all the units. Say you have a robo robotic, I mean we don't have a still a robotic machine here, so if you get one, I think it should be allowed to be used by so many people who can use without these things because when you, the, the expiry is the same and uh, we don't use the instruments for maximum. And uh, use reusable instruments as opposed to single use instruments. This will of course increase the, the efficiency of generally otherwise uh, there is environmental hazard also this, uh, re, uh, this re, uh, disposable instruments and equipment. So this will help um, to save again. Then avoid ad hoc ordering according to various people. It should be streamlined ordering of medicine and instruments. And measures such as solar energy, saving water, other renewable sources should be introduced. So encouraging burden sharing and income generation to obtain help from many altruistic organizations and people. We don't have a portal for such activity in public sector. They don't know how to help us. And then utilization of health insurances, because even if the patient is having a health insurance, the public sector, he is free. So in, we should, there should be a way where patients can be charged when they have insurances, or you can create some insurances. And paying ward concept. Our paying ward concept is totally, you know, uh, there is a set of paying wards, and there is no remuneration for staff, so the people don't like patients getting in there. So paying ward system should be transformed. And of course, you should have a stringent maintenance of accounts and good quality audit to find out where our uh, where our problems are and to amend it. There will be a lot of unhappy people, but still we have to do it. And finally, we have to think outside the box. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jawadina, for that uh, uh, very brilliant speech. Because uh, we don't think about the health economics in this country. I think it's time that we pay more attention to the health economics. So. On behalf of the college, the council and the College of Surgeons, I would like to thank you again, once again. And uh, then I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Duminda Ariratna, who is a consultant surgeon at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, so he is going to speak about uh, cut your coat according to the cloth. Over to you, Dr. Ariratna. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my senior colleague and uh, past president, Dr. Nishanka Jayavadhan, elaborated from an institutional perspective where we could act differently, think differently to save funds and navigate these difficult times. I'm just going to, there might be a certain amount of overlap, although we tried our level best and uh, did some blueprinting, nevertheless, to address this issue from a national perspective. So uh, the overview, uh, as we all know, Sri Lanka adopts a free health policy for all, even uh, overseas individuals working in Sri Lanka will qualify for free health care. Sri Lanka's total health expenditure is lower than middle income countries, but higher than South, Indian, uh, South Asian countries. So. Uh, this is something that we can be uh, proud of. Private sector contribution to the health expenditure, although we don't assume that way, is more than half, and it's on the rise. This is not purely surgical. This is by, in the form of provision of health care from a GP system. We have a lot of GPs around the country, lens and breaths. And to make the matters even more complicated, our health budget is 82% of recurrent expenditure. Yeah, we will uh, need these funds to keep
keep our services going. So very little room for uh, cost cutting from that perspective. This is the functional classification of Ministry of Health uh, budget reallocations. This is 2021. Nissan's draft of 2016 had 1% for, uh, three, four percent for medical research and uh, prevention, but it has come down to uh, about one to 2% in 2021 from a uh, uh, percentage wise. So just to elaborate on the expenses, we can broadly divide into three, infrastructure development, manpower, and consumables. So the difficulties that we might encounter, particularly during this time, is the first and foremost is financial difficulties that we face. It, we find it difficult to uh, provide health and, uh, drugs and consumables. Unable to repair or replace the equipment that we already have. We have laparoscopies, colonoscopies, and such equipment, which needs repair and maintenance of items that undergo wear and tear. Those have become extremely costly due to the fact that rupee has devalued. And there are financial restrictions where money going out of the country has been curtailed to a great degree. So these are issues that we face in our day-to-day -day practice. And the other impact is shortage of manpower. There's a very serious form of uh, brain drain happening right now. A lot of uh, individuals are migrating, especially the skilled workers like nurses and doctors and surgeons for greener pastures. And the, to complicate the matter matters further, the senior registrars or the postgraduate trainees who go for overseas training do not return knowing the situation is not so good back at home. And a new directive has made the uh, retirement age of the senior surgeons uh, to uh, reduce to former 60 years. We had, a, until last year, we had a system where the seniors could go on till 65 automatically without any uh, restriction whatsoever, but it has been abruptly cut down to 60, and that has a lot of implications. These people, are still very productive. Increased workload in the government sector due to the shrinkage of private sector. We see a large number of patients coming to our hospitals who fo in, in, formerly used to seek medical treatment in private institutions. Now the cost has become so much that they are unable to afford private healthcare delivery and they all end up in the government sector institutions making our workload much heavier. And Last but not least, training of postgraduates. Uh, we need this equipment and material to train our postgraduates locally. And fortunately, not so much for the surgeons, but in other specialties, for their compulsory overseas training, the postgraduate institute finds it difficult to fund them. So uh, that is another main concern that we have to consider. So uh, what's the way forward? I am inspired by this article, which I uh, was able to find Googling. Not a very modern, uh, sort of a latest article. It's an article of two, 12, uh, 2012, uh, www, 1000 lives, Wales, NHS uk. The improving quality reduces costs. This is the article. The theme is by not to reduce the quality to save funds, but to improve the quality and thereby try to economize our healthcare delivery system without compromising on the quality as, quality as a business strategy. How do we do that? We have to efficiently utilize our manpower, put people where they are much needed. And we do not, in this country, have an ID system for the patients. Although everybody carries a national ID card around, there is no system to recognize people or to register them by their identity card number. So to tell you uh, a simple example, if a person living in Kandy wishes to get his uh, surgical issue sorted, he could go to his hospital there. Let's say Navalapitiya. He is not happy with Navalapitiya. He goes to Kandy. Everything is restarted in Kandy again. And he's, if he's not happy about that, he might decide to come to Colombo. Colombo has no idea where it has been done to him in Naval Pity or Candy. We will start investigating him with all the expensive investigations all over again. So if you have a national ID reference system 
where we could access the patient's previous medical records, this could be saved. This is a very simple thing that we could do from a national level, which could save funds. And uh, regularizing referral system, as my uh, colleague Nishanka mentioned in his speech, uh, the sp re referral system in this country is so haphazard, anyone could walk into any institution. We are, there's no compulsion to adhere to protocols. There's no prioritizing and pa planning. There's resources are not used in the best possible way. And fiscal policies are quite lax. Manpower, you'll be surprised to hear that the Health Minister of Sri Lanka does not have a HR department. It's at 100,000 employees, but we have no HR department. We have no HR specialists in this institution level or national level. And we have regular working hours and we still have elective surgeries are carried out during working hours or daytime. We don't have a system like in Singapore where even the elective procedures could be carried out uh, around the clock, thereby economizing the hours of work and economizing the instruments that we have. And certain services are not, uh, might be better off outsourcing to the private sector and the central government bearing the cost of that and resource allocation has to be more stringent, and recruitment according to the requirement by the HR department and HR specialists. About the infrastructure, maximally use already established infrastructure institutions rather than commissioning new, time, new ones during these difficult times. Cut down or reassign institutions that are not very productive. To, in other words, to alleviate white elephants. Review the procurement uh, process, central coordination of expenditure rather than institution. We have a system of provincial councils and some of the hospitals fall into provincial councils. So their purchasing ability is not that great. But if you centrally acquire or procure instruments, we can go for a better deal due to the large number of acquisitions and large number of uh, uh, material that are being uh, purchased at a bulk rate would be more economical. Have said that procurements had to be uh, discourage and good quality products, not necessarily the cheapest one, the good quality products at a reasonable price. Administration-wise, private sector collaboration has to be encouraged. Policy making has to be reviewed, as Nishanka mentioned. We have an e-code, establishment code, which comes, dates back uh, from 1930s, I guess, that has not been reviewed. So working time modifications, adoption of modern administrative strategies into our health system. We are still going by the former system. We have no HR system. We have no managers who could help us with economizing the health services. Surgical service delivery by judicious use of expensive material, just because people come and promote expensive material, unless you are really convinced that these expensive materials are going to make a huge difference into our existing practice, we should not be in a hurry to acquire them. Uh, priority for emergencies when it comes to the worst case scenario, cancers and disabling electives as we did during COVID period has to be readopted if it comes to worst case scenarios. Minimize, minimize cosmetic surgeries in the government sector unless of course it causes a disability. MDT protocols, we, in the hospital that we work, we have MDTs and certain hospitals do not have MDC and there is no mandatory requirement that the surgeons have to stick to these MDT decisions from a national level. If you wish to proceed, you can proceed. There's no restriction. So that has to be enforced to see it's man making it necessary and compulsory to adhere to MDTs at institutional levels. And laying down and uh, 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 protocols in management of co uh, common conditions like NICE guidelines and institutional at national levels can also be. Donations and funding, Nishanka mentioned, there's no uh, proper track where even if people wish to donate, there is no proper way that they could make these donations in the government sector. And uh, one other thing is uh, expansion of the private sector component within the government sector, which Nishanka touched again. And health tourism, I think, should come in a big way uh, on this because we are centrally located, at least for the regional countries. Maldives is seeking medical attention from our uh, country and a lot of patients are coming into the private sector. So if there's a mechanism where we could divert those patients to government sector and expand our paying ward system that we have, as Nishanka said, make it, uh, in give incentives to everybody so that it will flourish and it will uh, generate a lot of foreign currency as well during these difficult times. And preventive measures, as you all, especially the overseas faculty would have seen how we travel, how is our 
uh, motoring system. There are no proper rules and regulations. Therefore, we have a lot of road traffic accidents as a result. Uh, every four hours, somebody is dying, and these are primarily due to workplace safety issues, uh, lack of road discipline, and uh, drink driving, and so on. So these rules have to be uh, much more uh, strongly enforced. And measures to control expenditure on diseases, which are due to bad health habit. Health insurance scheme has to be promoted for all the workers, and that should uh, be diverted to the government sector so that a big burden of provision of free health service can be taken off the healthcare delivery system, particularly the state sector. And uh, efficient health promotion and disease prevention measures should also be taken to prevent, save and economize money. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Duminda, for, uh, for that excellent talk and some very good proposals. It is my pleasant task to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Niluka T. Amarasingha, who is a senior banking management and academic professional. He will be speaking on optimizing health performance through novel approaches from an economist perspective. Over to you, Dr. Niluka. Good morning. I will be touching upon how to optimize health performance through novel management approaches. Now, in doing so, I will be assessing the current scenario and also looking at where we want to go, our objectives, and then what are the actions that are available for us to follow in uh, bringing the health services to a better uh, managed level. So let's look at the challenges that we have faced today. As we all, all know, the economic crisis in Sri Lanka has created many issues. It is so for health industry as well. So foreign currency issue is the major problem that we are seeing today, which has crippled our ability to import many goods. <clears throat> the inflation has skyrocketed and we are also seeing local funding issues where many organizations are unable to uh, meet their day-to-day -day, uh, activities as well as to meet their commitments. On top of all this, we are seeing higher taxes uh, and it's going to remain for some considerable period of time according to our understandings. If you look at the human resources of organizations, we are seeing a higher level of talent outflow, professionals leaving and migrating, and the trainings have not happened for some time, mainly due to COVID situations. So this has created a huge debacle in human resources, even in health industry. So if you look at the medicine and equipment status, we are seeing a high level of scarcity in medicine, Defective equipments and shortages in supplies. And if you look at the psychological level of staff who are involved in the industry, we can see a high level of staff burnout, high stress levels, and a lot of coordinating issues. Looking at the logistics, we clearly see that there are procurement delays and supply delays especially when it comes to uh, health sector, where the procurement processes are a bit stingier uh, and therefore, which has really affected the industry. The political scenario, we all see that the unrest has been remaining for some time and it is still uh, in existence. And we are seeing unstable policies and leadership issues. So where do we want to go? If I just look at uh, the objectives of healthcare services in any country, for that matter, we need to achieve excellence in patient care and health services. That would be the, the paramount uh, important uh, objective any country would have. Then improving efficiencies is really important as that would uh, pay the uh, that would create the 
background in achieving the above said excellence. So reducing uncertainties by adapting contingency plan is something that subcontinent uh, you know, has to really focus on. Now, our countries typically are not very much concerned on reducing uncertainties. And therefore, we don't have proper plans for contingencies. This is where we have to focus on. Identifying and using the best talent is something that any country would like to have in their health sector. Resources we all know is scarce, and therefore the optimal utilization is going to take you to greater heights. Closing the gaps on health inequalities is something that uh, health services should also focus on. So having understood the background, having understood where we want to go, we need to look at what remedies that are there through some of the time-tested management processes, uh, which is also relevant to uh, health sector as well. So I would take you through a few uh, uh, remedies or action plans that we can propose, of which has been researched uh, theoretically and also been practiced by many uh, health sector organizations and found to be really effective. So the first remedy that I'm going to suggest is the quality circle. The quality circle is a group who will be always focusing on improving the quality. So you can see the definitions given here. But if you look at the real uh, functionalities, how it works, I would like to explain it uh, as follows. So a hospital or a health sector organization should create a quality circle in their establishment. You need to focus on improved health services and patient care at all times. Now, this slogan should be uh, the, uh, the, the talk of all the members of the uh, quality circle. And they should keep it at the center uh, whatever in whatever they do. So the representation for this uh, quality circle team should consist of doctors, nurses, administrators, finance staff, and support staff. So you ensure that all segments, all uh, different uh, departments are getting together and participating in this exercise. So you use this team as a cross-functional committee for better coordination and communication. We know in organizations, different sections, departments work in their silos. So the communication and collaboration doesn't happen in such a way, and therefore uh, a lot of inefficiencies can take place. So this is a very good uh, initiative to eliminate those inefficiencies. So you identify small steps in developing improvements in systems and processes. So through the team, you try to identify some other bottlenecks, some other uh, burning issues that you need to tackle. So the ownership to be taken by the committee and you are the champions in driving change for the organization. You would be training, you would be uh, motivating the others to follow and this drive would really uh, take the entire organization to a greater levels. So you need to have monthly meetings and all members need to contribute uh, in these meetings, which you are going to have uh, in frequent times. Uh, and whatever achievements that you come across in this exercise, it may be a small achievement, but still you need to celebrate them. So this is how, in general, a quality circle would uh, work. And this, I suggest, uh, the health sector to adapt, to improve their uh, processes and systems and efficiencies. The next remedy that I'm going to propose is called as business process reengineering. So as you can see the definition here, what it does is it breaks down the end-to-end -end processes that the health sector organizations are having into small uh, chunks of 
activities. By doing so, you will be able to understand the need, the effectiveness, the efficiency, the responsibilities of staff for this each part that they are involved. So how are we going to get engaged in this? So you need to look at some of the major processes that your organization is having. You need to segregate them. Then also you can segregate the minor processes that you have. So based on the importance of the processes, you can break them into uh, small steps. So once you break them into small steps, you can identify whether all these steps are needed or not in the first instance. So there you get a chance to identify whether you should drop those steps or should you change them. And also, when you really analyze these steps, you can see the time and other resources that are being utilized for these little steps to happen. So you can identify the bottlenecks in each step. So now you understand the entire process in detail in a more scientific manner. And what you do now is, based on the importance of it, you redesign. So you take away the unnecessary processes and you redesign the process. So when you redesign, you need to weigh the uh, risks that are involved in the new design. So you ensure that you take some uh, calculated risks in rearranging the processes. So once you rearrange the processes, you allocate responsibilities for each step. So there will be people responsible uh, for each step that are coming under these major end-to-end -end processes. And then you need to introduce a monitoring process where people are monitoring the, pro the, the progress of this newly arranged uh, action plan in, in terms of uh, the, the processes. The simple reason is uh, generally we tend to go back to our old methods of doing things. Uh, Recording in progress. So we need to ensure that it won't happen. So some of the other uh, initiatives that I just want to uh, stress here are identifying non-utilizing assets and disposing them. Now we are seeing in many government organizations, there are so many uh, idle assets, we call them as, non-utilizing assets are available. So you should try to identify them and dispose them. And also, uh, health sector organizations can create a better environment by introducing greenery. I know that many uh, hospitals in Sri Lanka did this uh, in many parts uh, and they have been successful in doing it. You can introduce proper waste management systems. By doing so, you, you would be able to eliminate clutter and also bring uh, properly managed uh, waste uh, and eliminating many other negative repercussions. Also, we need to look at sustainability concepts. Importantly, the renewable energy concepts like solar. So there are so many rooftops that are not being utilized. There are so many other spaces that are there. And there are many agencies uh, who are willing to support this uh, cause of which you would be able to uh, reduce your cost in terms of your energy consumed. <laughs> Another concept that is <clears throat> very important to be adapted to health sector is 5S. It's a Japanese concept. Uh, you all must be knowing that many hospitals adapted this. So uh, there's still uh, more uh, space to improve on this. So this would ensure uh, well-organized uh, 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 health sector uh, establishments, and it would reduce the uh, time consumed, consumed uh, by the employees as those, those five S uh, implemented uh, workplaces are well-defined and uh, well-structured. You could also partner with external organizations so that you can get support uh, to improve your efficiencies and also your funding. Now, most of these initiatives might need funding. So these external organizations can support you uh, in getting the required funding. Another way of uh, raising your funds uh, is called as crowdfunding or crowdsourcing uh, projects. 
So this crowdfunding is an online platform. And using the platform, you can raise funding from uh, many people across the world for uh, ethical uh, projects that you need to implement in your uh, hospitals. And also, there are many charitable organizations who are willing to come in uh, in partnering in these type of projects. So, with all these remedies that I proposed, you would be able to create a pathway for improved healthcare. So, these few initiatives in improving the quality and efficiency would benefit the patients, staff, and the nation as a well. whole. So, I would like to say. Uh, good luck in the efforts of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Luka Amarasthunga, for that excellent presentation. I think uh, all of us tend to look at this problem from a different point of view, and I wish the policymakers of this country should wish they could take a note of what's transpired today. And I wish the College of Surgeons would uh, lead the way in recommending all these things to the government. And on behalf of the Council and the College of Surgeons, I wish to thank all these three speakers for their excellent speeches. Thank you.